Um, August, you pointed out this is the first time ever that the four of us have been in the same place at the same time. I was really surprised by that fact, but yeah, that's uh, that, that's that's the case. It's I can't believe it. We've been you know talking so much, but this is the first time the four of us is in the same spot. It's unbelievable. So, Adam, I asked this to the guests a lot, but since you're sitting next to me, can you just set the scene here? Describe where we are and what's going on. So this is the open day. We just finished the open day afternoon, and we are all sat around the saloon table that uh, Andy is really partial to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with East Beyond uh, more ne- next to us, um, and we're sat here in Bergen in the lovely Norwegian July weather. Sunny and 26 <laughs> Celsius yesterday and raining today, of course. Of course. That's right. Um, Mia, how does it... We always talk about how we get inspired by like getting the people that we work with together, but also getting like people that want to sail with us together. And that was what we did today with his open house. We had a bunch of staff here. Mano and Jojo are also here having just sailed Falcon up from Galway. How does it feel to you? And and like, how do you, do you get more inspired being in like these situations? Yes, of course. Uh, It's uh, especially because a lot of the crew, uh, they were on the last trip. I got to meet them, which is great because I send a lot of emails to the crew. So it's great to see them and just to see how many people come just to check out the boats and who have been following the podcast. And it's like a, just a big community and getting everyone in person, I think, is so valuable. And that's why I really love these events. Showing everyone the boats, too, is really cool. And having the boats to, next to each other and be able to for people to have sailed Falcon and then step onto Eastby and see what a difference it is. And also like for people listening to the podcast and knowing about what we do to be able to see them in face because it's so different seeing photos and videos versus actually stepping on and getting the feel. Well, how did it feel for you? You haven't been on Eastbjorn in a long time and neither you or me have seen Eastbjorn since the last refit at Vinda. So how did it feel going back on Eastbjorn? I mean, it feels just like home, <laughs> so, to be honest. She's beautiful. I mean, she did a lot of nice upgrades to her, but the whole feel is still the same. And it just, yeah, feels like I was on her like yesterday. I got to say, guys, like I'm super impressed with how the boat, it's Eastbjorn's 10th season this year. And the boat's better than she's ever been before. That boat's in better condition now, by far, than any time we've ever had the boat before. Um, and it's just, like, really nice to be back. Like, I agree with you. It does feel like home, but also feels like a better version of home. Of course, yeah. It's like if you've gone home again, but, like, somebody that's lived in your house for the last five years has, like, made it really nice and fixed all the shit that you that you had dealt with for so many years. <laughs> so that felt, that felt really nice. Um what do you guys? Uh, I'll start with you, August. What What are you um, most looking forward to? Ah, uh, I um, well, there's so many, so many things. It feels like just having having us all here and the two boats, and uh, which are, you know, about to run off on their own little uh, adventures. Um, feel feels really good. Feels like a kind of a a kind of combined launch of uh, of the future in in a way. I just like seeing. This is the first time I've seen Falcon. That's, that's and true. It's, I it's should ask like, you, what's your impression it, of Falcon? It's just yeah, no, it's it's amazing. It's uh, you know I've been involved obviously, and I've seen all oh, tons of pictures and videos and all that stuff. But it's it's so different seeing her and um, yeah, makes makes it feel a little bit more real in a way. And just seeing the two boats together and all the people and everything and. It can get a little bit abstract when we're working remotely and having the two boats so far apart from each other. But no, this makes it feel very, very real and very um, fantastic. I I had that thought yesterday with all of us together in both boats here. It it feels like we actually are working together instead of in separate areas. It's like, oh, yeah, we have one business that does all this stuff together and we're one team instead of you over here and us over here and you over here and... That was like my feeling yesterday, which was really cool. I, w- I just wish we had the chance to do this more often. Like, imagine how cool it would be. Mm. Like, this, I mean, it wouldn't be the same business, but if we just, if both boats had one home port, we all lived in the same place, we all saw each other <laughs> oh. all the time. But I guess this, it's not as special if you saw each other each day. So, yeah, I think, you know, it, it is a little bit cool too with the, the how, you know, we're, we're a very international. Mm company we cross the oceans and we see different ports and things it's very fitting that we're also you know a norwegian swede american 
and for Scotland. So it's a, I guess <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. That's it, pretty is, nice. it is super cool. Uh, yeah. Adam, what, what are you um, excited about? I, I, well, I have to say that I'm, I feel like I'm a little bit of a common denominator in some of this because I think I've seen each of you at different times um, or, or, or together on different boats in different parts of the world. So sometimes it's, I'm, I kind of forget that I haven't seen you since Antigua. I haven't seen you since like January. And do you know what I mean? And kind of like, because because of that and the upgrades i'm like i can't remember what we've upgraded because it's so much has happened since then <laughs> um so i'm i'm really excited for tomorrow i'm really excited to blast cannons while blasting like pirates of the caribbean uh, aiming two boats at each other is that not what we're doing right <laughs> yeah exactly, uh, exactly. <laughs> and that's why we've got the huge boom speaker behind me too um so yeah i'm i'm really excited it, it still doesn't if yesterday felt really surreal to pull up alongside and i think we spoke about it briefly it's like doesn't doesn't quite feel it it feels super right but also feels very different to have them next to each other and like you said it is a great opportunity to sort of like yeah definitely kind of send send falcon off um for for a big bigger adventure next year yeah it's gonna be <clears throat> what is it 2024 now it'll be three years till this is gonna happen again we we have mm. a tentative schedule for 2027 after falcon will have spent two years in the pacific to do sort of a homecoming tour on Falcon of all the home ports in the Atlantic for 2027. So Annapolis, Bergen, um, probably come through Scotland, west coast of Sweden, uh, and hit all the places. So it's a long time. That's three years is, I mean, an eternity. Falcon didn't exist three years ago. <laughs> That's true, yeah. So um, August, real quickly, uh, while we're on this sort of intro stuff, tell us, we were just talking about before we started recording, you, you talked to Ian Herbert-Jones um, yes. for a big two-part episode. So give us the 30-second recap so we know what to look forward to. So we, Ian is fantastic. He's uh, become a really good friend of mine. And uh, he, you know, we initially became friends when he joined our uh, Celestial Navigation During class. COVID. During you COVID. and I did an online Celestial Navigation course. And he was preparing for the OGR. And he's like, shit, I better learn Celestial. That's right. That's right. So... Yeah. Um, GGR, yeah, oh, yeah, GGR, 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 yeah, the GGR. single-handed Golden Globe, yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, so um, so uh, I'm a very proud teacher now that he's completed two circumnavigations, or he didn't quite complete the first one uh, of his uh, Golden Globe. He uh, ended up in a pretty scary shipwreck, which we spent a lot of time talking about on the in this episode. And um, it was initially I thought it would be just one episode. We would talk about his um, GGR, and because he did sail the OGR as well, just afterwards. So I thought we would um, get all of that done in one episode. I was very wrong about that. So we had to reschedule and uh, or schedule another interview and do a part two about the OGR. But both episodes are getting released this week. And it's the uh, first one will be uh, the GGR episode. And um, yeah, it was it was fantastic. Uh, it was really a uh, really a treat to talk to Ian about this and. Uh, and do do stick around for the end of the episode because after we were done uh, with our interview and the mics were off and just Ian and I chatted a little bit more for uh, for some time and he told me of a very emotional little detail about his shipwreck story that um, I you know we didn't catch it on the mics but the backup Zoom recording caught it and I I asked Ian is it okay if we include this in the podcast and share this with with our listeners and uh, he said he was happy to so stick around for that at the very end um audio quality is not quite where i would like it to be but it's definitely worth it so stay Fair. tuned well you have high standards that sounds great that sounds like an episode i will actually listen to i normally don't listen to my hour podcast but i'm gonna listen to that one <laughs> great <Cool>. thank you <laughs> all right um great i super excited we got a big day tomorrow we're sailing both boats for a little photo shoot and uh it's i'm like one of those things i'm so excited to be here with all you guys but like leave it in three days it's like i just want this week to go forever so uh <laughs> yes. delighted to have you all here so uh august until next time hold fast this season of the on the wind podcast is brought to you by 59 north's very own quarterdeck the quarterdeck is our membership website and 59 north's home port on the internet it's a place where we post videos and articles and host live streams and all sorts of uh, fun. And we have a very knowledgeable community of members there that you can be a part of. Go to 59-north.com slash quarterdeck and sign up today for a two-week free trial.
We have a sizable and ever-growing archive of sailing knowledge on there that you can dig into. And uh, you also get access to a lot of the uh, procedures and tools that we have developed over the years at 59 North, um, such as checklists, maintenance protocols, logbook templates, and uh, all kinds of goodies that we have uh, perfected, uh, we believe, uh, over all the years of um offshore cruising and passage making that we have done so you will get access to uh editable files of all of these things and you can download them and modify them for your own sailing needs becoming a quarter rec member is also a great way to support what we do so uh that we can continue to make free sailing content for all you guys such as this free podcast so a huge thanks to everyone who signs up and to everybody who's already a member thank you so much for listening have a great day and i hope to see you on the quarter deck that's 59-north.com slash quarter deck Welcome to On The Wind, the podcast about offshore sailing. I'm your host, August Sandberg. Since his On The Wind debut on episode 359 two years ago, Ian Herbert Jones sailed 28,000 miles and rounded Cape Horn twice. In this episode, he tells the story of his remarkable Golden Globe race from the last polishing of his boat at the start in France to losing her in a storm in the South Atlantic. All right, Ian, it's so great to to, to see you again. How, How are you doing? I'm good, August. It's very nice to be here. It's very nice to be here again. Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you very much. That's great. You're you're, you're back now in um, in your home office uh, where we. Uh, uh, it's t- two years now since we uh, since we did this uh, last time. It's. Um, oh. Oh, oh. <laughs> I take your word for it. I've got no idea. Is it two years? It could be. It is. I, I don't. I don't feel two years older. But yeah, I'm back home in in rural Shropshire. So I mm. live. Uh, kind of in the centre of the United Kingdom, so but I'm in the in the countryside, maybe one hour south of Manchester. If people know where Manchester is, yeah. Uh, and I, and I'm in the attic. I've got this uh, home office up in the attic with all my charts on the walls, and you know it's my my little mission control. The thing. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that that's great uh, to to, ha- to have you back on, uh, Ian. And um, you know, you've uh, it's been two years. Have you been up to anything anything interesting the last? Uh, nah, three, not months? really. Uh, it's just <laughs> just the same. <laughs> couple couple of times around the world, it seems. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's when, been. Um, uh, been non-stop that's for certain yeah yeah you know when when we last spoke that was um you were getting close to the start of the uh, golden globe race the 2022 golden globe race and we talked a lot about your your preparations for that and um and all that so that was the theme of the of the last one and um uh, and yeah, I mean, we we haven't really talked since since the Golden Globe. What was um, uh, it's, uh, you know, yeah. it was it was really fun to to follow you from uh, you know with from your preparations and in, in, in the start and everything. And you know, it seemed like you had a yeah. really really good time. How uh... I did. <laughs> it, it, it was uh, it was quite the adventure for sure. It's kind of strange to cast your mind back that far because it was all about future plans at the time right it was all potential mm. and and preparation and and, and so on uh, and the ggr was probably uh august i want to say it was a three-year project for me or something of that nature plus a lot of thinking probably before that mm. so i guess when we spoke it the those couple of years of prep had come to a head we were we were heading for the start line um i was in pretty good I, you know i was in very very good state of mind uh, you know the boat was was going to be amazing we we were going to get there we were going to make the start line that was that was key right yeah. so, uh, so it's really they always say is there's, there's more than one race first race is just to get to the start line True. and uh, <clears throat> we did and we pulled that off and we were in you know we were in 
very good state of affairs, particularly compared to some of the guys who were, you know, struggling to get to the start line. They were there, but they weren't quite ready. Yeah. Uh, we were in pretty good shape. I think when we spoke, I was probably, yeah, reasonably stressed <laughs> about building up to that. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, also, I'd done, and I, had, I had done the homework. I had done the work. But it was all ahead of us, right? Mm. And now we're talking whatever later and... You know, I'm I'm sure I'm a changed person from what went what went forward after that. So the so the GGR was was a real experience. I mean, you know, the the quick summary is it started well. Uh, <laughs> it started, started well. very well. Yeah, uh, it started well, and and it was kind of everything I expected. I mean, it, it's probably the toughest thing I've ever done in my life. I had an amazing adventure around uh, once I got to Cape Horn, which is maybe something we'll we'll talk about, and I. And at that time, I thought that was the pinnacle of my adventure. I thought, you know, my, my Golden Globe race uh, changed when I got to Cape Horn. And maybe we'll talk about that August. But that, that was the pinnacle of my adventure. And then I right. went on, uh, after, rounded Cape Horn and continued up past the Falklands. And the short story is I got hit by a massive system, a massive you know, as, as I use the word storm very carefully amongst sailors. And I mean a storm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and um, I lost my boat puffing. I rolled, dismasted, and finally that resulted in a, in a rescue. Uh, where was I? I was kind of a thousand miles northeast of the Falklands. Uh, South Georgia was the nearest landfall, let's put it that way. And I lost my boat down there. And luckily for me, I was rescued by a Taiwanese fishing boat. And at that point, I'd been alone at sea for 219 days. Wow, and I was on I was on the homeward leg. Uh, you know, they should have been done and dusted. It was the downhill leg, going home. But I was still forty six degrees south, so I was still very much in the south. And yeah, so I was rescued. Ten days later, I was dropped off in Cape Town, <laughs> and that was the end of my Golden Globe race. <laughs> Man, that was um, yeah, that was uh, you know that that whole uh, storm and the rescue and everything. That was um. That was quite quite dramatic. I uh, I remember I was following the race quite closely at that time, and I remember the um, just looking at the daily updates, and you could see this low just kind of you know manifesting mm. right on top of you uh, there, and um, it was uh, quite a pretty uh, pretty uneasy. Don McIntyre uh, doing his uh, daily daily tracker updates and um and, and, and looking at you there and uh yeah no that was um that was that was pretty scary stuff how was but you also had because you went to anchor down after your rounding of cape horn you had a pretty rough uh, rounding of the horn too didn't you y- yeah yeah so kind of working working backwards almost in the story the yeah so my, my, my leg around the Golden Globe had, you know, it was, it, it was it's one hell of an adventure. Mm. Um, and it's quite interesting now looking back, the sort of conditions we had. I mean, it was literally feast or famine all the way. So we were either stuck in high pressures and going nowhere <laughs> or getting hammered. And there didn't seem to be anything in between. Uh, you know, this is sort of my memory of it, it's particularly after now just coming back from the Ocean Globe race and having a very different experience. Yeah. But um, I was kind of, so the, so the race left in the September from France, the idea being in the second edition of the race that they were worried about boats getting to the Southern Ocean too early. That was that was a part of the issue. So in the first edition with Susie and the guys and Abelesh and so on, uh, and Jean-Luc, they'd left in the July and the boats had had a great race down the North and South Atlantic and that ended up in the Indian Ocean really too early in the season. Yeah. So to counter that, what Don and the organisers did is move the race start back to September. Now, of course, no two years are the same, August, and our year was different and we all struggled to get, as, let's say, as far as Cape Town uh, with, with, we, you know, with the conditions. So we, we, you know, we had quite a few gales along the way but we all got stuck in 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 the high pressures at different times and it was a relatively slow progress so for me on puffin uh you know we're pretty much at the back of the fleet at the time and but it what it did is it put a couple of us on the back foot for the season all the way through so as i if you like finished the first big leg north north atlantic south atlantic going into into cape town 
I was really concerned about going to the film drop, these, this concept of sailing into the Table Bay, mm. meeting the GGR rib, dropping off, physically dropping off your films as they did back in the day, and my handwritten letters. That was all part of the race. So we'd done that in Lanzarote, which is kind of the shakedown. Uh, and if you go back, and the, the guys that follow the 2022 Golden Globe race, you know, we got to Lanzarote, and uh, had we lost two boats by then? Three boats had dropped out. What, uh, Guy de Boer, unfortunately, his boat ended up on the beach. Yeah, uh, oh, that's on, right. On Fortaventura. So he was just ahead of me. And, you know, I heard that on the radio. So, you know, that even that first, what you might call the shakedown leg, had shaken down the, the fleet. You know, Guy, unfortunately, that he recovered his boat eventually, but for the, for the sake of the race, he was out. He'd lost his boat. He was on the beach. Yeah. Uh, I think Edward had dropped out. Edward was one of the most prepared boats you've ever seen in your life. I thought I was prepared until mm. I met Edward, who had two hydrovanes on his boat. That's how prepared he was. <laughs> um, and a few days in, it was uh, Edward's head wasn't in the space, you know, because the enormity of crossing the, the start line of the GGR is quite a thing. So you've had three years of build up. There's you think you're just going to be waiting to start, but in reality, it's, it's, a, it's a circus at the beginning. It's amazing. There's so many people there to see you. You don't get a moment to yourself. You're saying goodbye to family. So the two weeks before are really tough on the skippers mentally, and you're trying to prepare a boat. Yeah. And then suddenly you go down that famous canal, as they call it, the channel going out, the harbour going out of the Saab de Lone, where you've seen all the Vendée Globe boats go out. Mm. And, the, you know, the place is lined with people. There's tens of thousands of people waving you off and shouting your boat's name. And it's, wow, it's just, it's amazing. It's just an amazing experience. But bloody hell, August, 24 hours later, guess what? You're all on your, <laughs> you're all on your effing own. <laughs> and it's all over. And all you've got ahead... And for me, I planned for, you know, up to 300 days at sea. Yeah. All you've got ahead of you is 300 days alone. <laughs> uh, and those first two weeks do mess with your head. There's no two ways about it. It's pretty hard to get into the crew. <laughs> and it's like you look behind you and go, ah, oh, OK, I've actually gone now. This is, <laughs> oh, so this is what they call commitment. This is what they call commitment, you know. <laughs> so, um, so we'd all, well, I guess we'd, the fleet had gone down through the Canaries you know, people have dropped out. That's a bit of a shake-up as well because you're all, certainly, I was feeling as shaky as anybody. Mm. You know, missing home, the enormous, you know, I don't know, you're missing family, but you're missing family in a different way because you can't pick up a phone, remember. There's yeah. no way of sending a text message or, a, you know, a WhatsApp anymore. And you mm. knew all of that intellectually, mm. but I don't think you know it emotionally yeah. until you're there. And by the way, side note, I'm now running on Astro Navigation, so there's no GPS on board. I've actually got, I've actually got to find the Canaries, side note, you know, just in case. And you think, what on earth have I let myself in for here? Yeah, it's... So if, if we looked cool, trust me, we weren't feeling cool. Any of us. <laughs> Maybe with the exception of a couple of the, uh, the guys that had uh, been there before. Um, so uh, the, the, the long the, the, that's a, a long way of of going back in. We 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 the fleet got to the Canaries. People had dropped out. We did had a reasonably rough trip down towards the um, Cape Verdes, and then things slowed down. And particularly for me, so I really struggled through the doldrums. Mm. Uh, I was going absolutely insane, trying just trying to escape the doldrums. It was like a trap. And every time I thought I could go forward, somebody put a wall in front of me, a wall of zero wind, basically, yeah. on my nose. And I really, really struggled to get through, broke through, picked up the trade winds, happy days again on the way down to Trinidad, or Trinidad Island, which was a rounding mark for us, and then heading towards Cape Town. And it was slow, and then it was really slow for me. And I struggled, and what that meant was finally it put us, I put a number of us quite behind where you would ideally want it to be. Mm. And August, I've just seen the same route with the Ocean Globe race, like two months earlier, I guess, something like that. I'd have to, I, I must go and look exactly the time difference of where I was in Golden Globe and where I was with the Ocean Globe race. Mm. And the difference, the difference is night and day. The difference is night and day, mm. you know, um, in terms of the conditions. 
Yeah. So the Indian Ocean was pr- maybe maybe probably good timing for the Indian Ocean, but it was getting harder and harder. And the the gate, the cut off gate, was the end of December. We had to be past Tasmania or in and out of the film gate in Hobart. Otherwise, the race wouldn't let you continue because of the concern about going around Cape Horn at the end of the season. Yeah. That's right. I remember and of course, that. We there had was a pact. A, a yeah. little bit of a stress. Uh, did, did uh, yeah, yeah. No, I remember that. There was um, a cutoff point there, so uh, it was a bit of a. Uh, and it was a heck of a target because actually, rather than Cape Horn or getting home, the target was then Tasmania. So going into Cape Town at the time to me felt like a, a distraction I didn't need. It was probably going to take another eight days off my course. Then I've got to work my way around the Agulhas Bank and the conditions coming out. I mean, going into Cape Town, if you're going to stop, makes tons of sense. Going into Cape Town to do a 360 or 180 sail out makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, <laughs> no sailor in the world would suggest that's a good idea. You know, for all, I, I, and of course, you know, bless him, Don. I hope you're listening. What a really bad idea that is to make us all do that. <laughs> But so, so we all, I think we all got a little bit tense about the idea of having to go into Cape Town. Yeah. Mine turned out to be a very nice story in the end. And there's a story there as well, because go, by actually going in, I made a connection with the guy on the rib, uh, Rianne Schmidt, who has become a connection for life because they became my adopted family. Because next time I was in Cape Town, I was being dropped off by a Taiwanese fishing boat. Right. And the same people picked me up. Oh no! Way. Who I have had never met before the race. I, I who I didn't didn't know at all. Oh, that's yeah, amazing. So, yeah, this uh, the world is. Uh, yeah, the universe plays tricks on you, uh, and he played two tricks on me in Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to hear this? Do you want to hear this? Oh story? yeah, anyway, absolutely, go. absolutely. Yeah? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> so the universe plays two played two tricks on me then. Um, so I was getting all uh, hot under the collar about not going into Cape Town because I was behind schedule. Just that if, if you, um, G- I mean, you could have done that, but then you would have been in the Chichester class. Is, was that the rule, or how was the? Let me remember. Uh, no, did, would I have gone into Chichester for not doing that, or would I have got a penalty? I, do you know what? I'm not sure it was clear mm. because I don't think the race organisers had envisaged <laughs> that we wouldn't do it. <laughs> we'd have to ask Don. Yeah, I can't remember, but but it was worth. Certainly, the the uh, mindset I was in, obviously, after getting that far, getting essentially to Cape Town, at the time it, it made more sense to me to avoid the the pit stop. It's not a pit stop to avoid the film drop. I'm sorry, and continue uh, and take whatever penalty it was. And I can't remember. Maybe there wasn't a jeopardy. Maybe we we were you know we we it was, we we could have avoided it. Mm. Um, so prior to that, you're having your weekly satellite calls, which is our only outside communication with race control. And, and get this, right? You're going to sail around the world alone for 250 to 300 days. And the only person you can talk to is Don. Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I love Don and he knows that, but still. But luckily by then he'd worked that out and he, other people were coming on the phone. So Seb in the office, Lutz, who I know you spoke to recently. That's uh, that's right. He he even said that he uh, enjoyed very much enjoyed talking to you. You're uh, one of the more um, uh, one of the more chatty uh, 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 skippers. Okay. He talked to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we only get to talk to somebody once a week. I'm going to talk to them, yeah, <laughs> whether they like it or not. <laughs> Obviously, yeah, I, I would too. <laughs> so I think I was talking to Sebastian Seb. And he kept saying, yeah, yeah, understand, understand. And he, and there was just a hint in the back of his voice that you really should go into, you really should do that, you know. But of course, he's not allowed to say that. Mm. And um, you, whenever you put the phone down from one of those calls, some of the skippers maybe suffered from this more than I did, people would read into what they just heard from Don on the other side. Was he hinting about the weather? Was he hinting about the... Uh, <laughs> And we'd be on the HF radio comparing notes. Mm. And I'd say to Michael, no, Michael, it's in your head, mate. <laughs> he wasn't hinting at anything. <laughs> um, so Seb had something in his voice. I stuck to the, stuck to the plan. I knew, I knew there was, you know, family and friends out there watching this. And although I couldn't tell, so I, I hell with it. So we, you know, I made my way to Table Bay. 
Fa- found South Africa, which is you know always 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 a bonus. So well done, fa- well done. Fa- <laughs> uh, right down by the Cape of Good Hope, so I had a great landfall, I recall, um, and worked my way up the coast that day. And eventually, you come into Table Bay, and you're on the radio at this point with GGR Race Control because they're going to come out with the rib and talk to you. All good. Got con- and they said, yeah, yeah, we're coming. We're, we're going to come out. And I'm trying to still work out exactly where I was in relation to. The, the harbour of, of, of Cape Town. Because as you approach it, you know, you really can't see it until you're on top of it if you're approaching from the anywhere from the south. Mm. Um, kind of figured out where I was. Eventually, got, we're in communication, yet yeah, the rib's coming out, and I can see the rib coming to, towards me eventually, getting a little bit excited now, but equally a bit pissed off, to be honest, because really I was <laughs> just shipping all over the place. Wasting the weather time, was coming yeah. in. <laughs> what am I doing here? And I'm, I'm like, just as a solo sailor, I do not want to be on the, just outside the, the harbour of, of Cape Town with all this shipping going on. There's loads of VHF mm. noise, uh, background. I'm thinking, crikey, it's going dark. I can see the rib, great, the rib's coming, rib's coming. There's a guy in the front of the rib sort of hanging on uh, like a Navy SEAL or something, like hanging on, you know, as you do on the front of the rib, you're riding a rib, boom, boom, and it caught my eye. And I'm furling sails at this point because of the rules, head sails had to go away, you have to have one reef in your main, 15 things that Don's made up in, in, in his imagination at night that you have to do, putting banners up on the side of the phone. <laughs> All of which, trust me, none of the skippers appreciate having to do at that moment. <laughs> I bet. And, and this guy catches my eye, and the rib's getting closer, closer, closer. It's catching my eye, catching my eye. A blonde guy in the, in the bow of this rib. And it just comes in, and of course, it's my son, Owen. And I was absolutely wiped me out. Oh, no wow. expectation of seeing it. <laughs> oh. oh, wow. So he, he'd been dispatched to Cape Town because everybody thought I was sounding a bit down and was going to need a boost. Yeah, and there was I, not not even going to bother to go into, <laughs> into Cape Town, and he was sitting on a rib, and they're all waiting, like you know, for every update. You know, is he going to come in? Is he going to come in? You know, oh, what's wow. he doing on the track? And no, no, because I went very low and then came up. If you like, all, essentially to the Cape of Good Hope and up the coast. Yeah, uh, and there was a certain theory that I I got close and changed my mind. <laughs> and they're all. Oh wow! So, that uh, must have been. Uh, that must have been huge yeah I mean, uh, special yeah, yeah yeah it blew me away actually because it was so unexpected you know so unexpected because we never had a plan as a family i you know i didn't expect anyone to go around the world on the hope that i might turn up you know in a film drop it was just not an expectation at all so yeah so that was amazing and then <laughs> operating the rib that day and driving the rib, well, drop both driving the rib and, and and filming for ggr was a guy called rian schmidt and never heard of him before. I didn't know that Rian had been looking after Owen while he was in Cape Town, my son. I didn't know any of that. Oh, great. Uh, and then whatever it was, 150 days later, I'm turning up on a Taiwanese fishing boat, and who picks me up? It's Rian and his wife. Right? <laughs> so my, 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 my adopted family in Cape Town. Oh, so. wow. Wow. Oh, that must have been... And, uh... And, that, and do you want to complete this circle? And then a week, was it 10 days ago from now, I met Explorer from the Ocean Globe race mm. in at Gosport to meet Rianne off the Ocean Globe race because he was on the last leg with Explorer. Oh, he was so on board the boat. So I got to boat. return. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, right. he was on board of the boat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if that hasn't confused whoever's li- listening, no, nothing will. But um, Oh, no, that's, that's anyway, great. That, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> How how old is the son, by the way? So the Owen's 21, 22. Oh, right. 22 now. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You wouldn't believe it to look at me, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. That's, that's uh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, Wow, that's, uh, that's incredible. That's, uh, wow. So, what, a special, um, what a special thing that must have yeah. been to, to see him. Was that... I'm curious, like, was that was that motivating for you, or was that like, did that make the whole thing even tougher? I could see kind of both things happen. Yeah, it was um, very tough going away that night. Was very tough. Mm. Um, I think the the interesting thing was um, uh, people at home and in the team had obviously were, were obviously sensing that I was maybe um, ready to drop out of the race. Mm. Because what, and the interesting thing is because I was, re- I think, was I at the back of the fleet? I was not quite, but maybe I was nearly at the back of the fleet. 
people had dropped out in Cape Town. Cape Town was, is a logical place if you like, if you are going to drop out. So a number of boats had dropped out again. We were down to wherever we were, down eight or nine boats at that point. <clears throat> so I think the, you know, the uh, w- w- the way the world was looking at the race, people were dropping like flies. Mm. Uh, Pat had dropped out. Uh, Damien had dropped out for stuff. So and now Ian's coming in. So I think the guys at home and in the team must have thought I was maybe borderline. I think the honest truth was I had no intention, absolutely no intention of dropping out. Mm. I may not have been very pleased about this diversion in Cape Town, but it hadn't crossed my mind. Then, of course, Owen turns up and I go, oh, my God, that's <laughs> like leaving all over again. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. in a sense, it was a, in one sense, it was amazing. And it turned out to be a really strange, you know, um, maybe it turned out to be an amazing boost. But it, it was amazing to see him, but it was extremely hard to go away. But if I had a if I had any doubts about carrying on, then that reset the clock for me. There's absolutely no way I was going to stop, mm. you know, if, if, if there was anything there brewing in the back of my mind. So there was no way I was giving up. And I also knew, honestly, August, and there was a pact amongst a couple of us that whatever happened in Tasmania, if we didn't make the cutoff and we were out of the race, I was still continuing. I was still going to Cape Horn. I was still coming home. There was there was no way I was stopping in Tasmania either. Yeah, rules or no rules. And there were a couple of us that had that pact. And I think Don, whether he allows himself to admit it secretly, he knows that whatever he said, we weren't we weren't going to stop. Yeah, because the, we get past the point, and you're there. You know that's what you do. You you're you're pelagic at that point, right? This is you know you, it's yeah. a shakedown. Then it's getting used to it, and then that is life. This is what I do every day, and I I think I'd found that point by by Cape Town. So yeah, probably. I I, I guess you know this it's kind of a way of the race to uh, to not be responsible for whatever would happen to you guys if you went sort of too late in the season so that's, uh, but yeah. I bet I, I, I bet they wanted you guys would have wanted you guys to continue anyway so it's like the ultimate disclaimer I think before before the bungee jump isn't it they say well <laughs> that, that, if you're right. going to go now you're on your own Sorry. you're on your own so, sign the disclaimer yeah 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 exactly yeah. Wow. So yeah. You, anyway. So uh, sorry. Go yeah. On. No. You so you spent. You didn't spend a long time. Just like a, a day or so in uh, on anchor there in in Cape Town, and then off you. No. Went, not 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 that. Thirty minutes. No. No. Thirty minutes. Thirty it's minutes. Literally, you meet you meet the rib. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. You get some news from home. You hand over your letters. Handed over handwritten letters and my SIM cards for the images which they they want you to do. And this is it, right? Thirty minutes later, the ribs pulling away, yeah. and Owen and Rianne are gone, and you're 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 back to where you were when you left Lasab. Oh wow, that's uh, <laughs> wow. So your your son flew to flew to Cape Town to to, to see his dad for thirty minutes, and then uh, off you go. That's uh, that's love right there. Yeah, well, that's I, amazing. It's either that or it was a free trip to Cape Town. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, wow! But yeah, so it's it's a pretty quick thing, and it's uh, I guess it's all part of the story of the, the GGR, right? It's an emotional journey as much as in, much as much as a physical journey. So yeah, oh my um, bad. And uh, and yeah, then off you off you off you go again, all all by yourself, and uh, and uh, yeah, Indian Ocean was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, the quick rundown. I think the Indian Ocean was really good for us. The timing was probably pretty good in the Indian Ocean. Um, and then the you know the next big uh, uh, moment is uh, uh, Tasmania and Storm Storm Bay, or you know they call it the Hobart film film drop, mm. uh, and, and that was the big cutoff. It had to be there before the end of December to be allowed to continue through the Pacific to uh, to Cape Horn, and uh, yeah, that was pretty good. I tell you, <laughs> another one finding Tasmania was a massively proud moment for me. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds crazy, doesn't it? But you know, <laughs> making landfall on Tasmania was amazing, actually, and very uh, pretty nerve wracking. You know, because you get used to you know doing your navigation. It's like, let's face it, you're going east. How complicated can it be? Mm. You know. <laughs> um, so you know, sights doing sun sights and doing astro navigation gets increasingly difficult as conditions get worse and the weather's obviously much grayer down there and so yeah. on so it's not not that easy but it was a it was yeah a big very proud moment for me 
actually, you know, making that landfall just just south of Tasmania. Uh, and then I had a horrible 48 hours of headwinds going nowhere. Um, <laughs> and then navigating into Storm Bay. Who thought that was a good idea, by the way? Don McIntyre, <laughs> you know. <laughs> what, what, why do you think, you know, a solo, solo sailor being at sea, well, whatever time, by that point, 150 days, uh, and then trying to navigate your way up, you know, around the, the, the bottom of Tasmania and up Storm Bay. Oh, my God. Mm. August, not you know, not without stress. Um, I can imagine, but it, but it, it, but we pulled it off. You know, I say we, Puffin and I pulled it off, um, and then had a, a fantastic sail up Storm Bay uh, to just outside Hobart uh, for the big film gate, and that one, that was that was you know that was that was pretty uh, pretty special as well. It, of all the places where you could have stopped in that race, you were really close to it. There, you can smell the burgers in the sailing club that's on oh, the beach. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> People are kayaking out to you, you know, to say hello and ran, ran around the boat. Oh, you're so close to civilization. And, and you've come so far at that point. Yeah. You know, you feel like it's been one hell of an achievement. Mm. And big, a big adrenaline, adrenaline drain because, of, I don't know, three, it's probably took me three days from making landfall, did it, to get in, something like that. It's pretty... You know, you haven't slept, put it that way. That kind of coastal navigation, trying to get yourself in. Yeah. Really, really, really difficult. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know, best part of it, at least a near gale or a gale on the nose for about 24 hours of it. So Oof. I was pretty worn out yeah. by the time I got there. Yeah, pretty miserable. If you'd, if you'd been sailing in to stop, you would have gone, Oof, what a passage. Thank <laughs> God we're here. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and just hit the bar re- as fast as you can. You definitely would not have taken your sea wellies off. Let's put it that. You would have been straight in the bar. <laughs> um, and you can't, of course. You can just smell, you literally can smell the bloody burgers. Yeah. You? <laughs> and, you know, nobody, yeah. nobody could have, uh, you know, uh, brought a burger in, on their kayak to you because then it would have been assisted right so that would have outside broken assistance. the rule yeah, yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah. outside assistance oh, man. So, uh, so that was uh that was pretty good um and that was kind of hard to leave but i was really you know keen just to get going and then it's the race to get to cape horn in time to get get around the corner mm. in the season so uh yeah um and you know the pacific it was just, you know, the Southern Ocean, the Southern Pacific was uh, kind of as expected. Essentially, it was things were just getting, you know, later and later in the season. The season was changing. It was, it was obvious the, you know, as I said, it was feast and famine all the way. Had plenty of, you know, no wind moments even down in the, in, in the south. But the the regularity of the near gale, the four seven or whatever, that just became that. That's the, you know, you all. It's not the gale. It's not the force eight. It's not. It's not thirty five knots. But thirty knots becomes the new twenty knots in your life when you're down there right. for a long time. And thirty five is the new twenty five, and so on. <laughs> that just becomes the pattern and the norm. Yeah. And you do get very used to it. You get used to sailing it. You get used to handling it. You, you know, it's it's you know we all we're, we're we're very adaptable, aren't we, August? We get used to whatever you know whatever's put in front of us enough times. That's that's um, true. Yeah. It's 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 like when you're. Uh, when you're in, when you get hit by bad weather out in the ocean, the, the wind's like building, and then like it, when it hits thirty knots, you're feeling, oh, okay, this is this is this is pretty getting pretty mm-hmm. heavy, and then maybe it goes up to forty, maybe above forty for uh, maybe a day or so, and then when it goes back down and you reach thirty again, going down, you're like, oh, this is great, it's over now, it's, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> this, this is this is sweet, so uh, you know, I know exactly what you mean, yeah. Well, we're strange creatures, aren't we? And mm. um, so, you know, that was great. Uh, a lot of anxiety as you then have to head uh, down to 56 degrees south um, because there, there'd been gales and storms ahead. We're all on the HF radio. We're all communicating as a fleet and every, everyone was going to get it at some point. You know, there was no two ways about it. So mm. <clears throat> a gale is a gale. We're getting plenty. You know, they were coming through every four or five days. But the, the long and the short of it, the longer you spend down there, the higher the risk. The longer you spend down there, the more likelihood you're going to get an eight, a nine, a ten at some point. You know, just your chances of not that not happening are, are getting slimmer all the time. Yeah. Uh, and again, I was at the back end of that uh, with Jeremy, I suppose he and I, and then behind us, uh, Guy. Guy Waits was had had other issues, so he'd slowed right down. So you know, he had he had uh, 
he was stopping in Hobart for, uh, uh, I think he had to stop for his life raft to be replaced. Oh, right. And so he, you know, again, he was on a, he was, a, a, like myself, he, he also had the wrong end of the season. So did, so did Jeremy, certainly. Uh, Kirsten getting around early was at the better end, but she, you know, she had a hard time getting down towards Cape Horn as well. You know, nobody was going to go down there untouched. Mm. And uh, I'd, I, for me and Puffin, Puffin and I, we'd done okay. Uh, and there's even a moment where we thought we we're going to have quite a good rounding. We were getting weather uh, information at that time from Passage Guardian out of New Zealand over the HF radio. Mm. Just the IMO information, but at least we were getting high seas forecasts most most days um and so we're kind of trying to plan ahead and it looked like it actually looked like was i was going to have quite a decent rounding uh <laughs> of course that wasn't going to be the case <laughs> you know so that didn't quite work go to plan yeah. Uh, there is um, uh, enough, uh, as, sorry, and I gotta say, uh, uh, there, there is yeah. this great YouTube video, if I remember correctly, of uh, of you talking to the camera down there as you approach your rounding, and you see like you're, you're holding on more and more for every cut, and like it's just talking about how the conditions are deteriorating. Um, I need to go and, and, and watch that again, but yeah, that's um, uh, yeah, that was that seemed to be building quite dramatically. I did a lot of complaining about the weather. The, you know, I wasn't quite sure what to film, but I'd go down and just ran, ran to the camera. I was never, ha- well, I was never happy with whatever the weather was doing. I was never happy, <laughs> and uh, yeah, a fair bit of ranting. But yeah, I mean, so you know, we we we'd had the conditions you might expect. It was exactly the way you'd expect if you were going to sail the Southern Ocean. So we'd absolutely had that drop down towards Cape Horn uh, and trying to thread the needle. There, had, there was going to be a system, then I was going to miss it, all good. And then I was not going to get any weather information for about 48 hours because Passage Guardian w- was not going to be available. Mm. So I, st- I suddenly had this window and the last message, the last bit of information I got was, okay, you've got a, you've got a gale growing coming your way. And I I was trying to decide whether I literally stopped the boat, I hope to, in the hope that it was going to go ahead of me All and then right. go behind it, or I tried to get ahead of this next system. But I, this is this is the thing about the Golden Globe race and sailing in this way. You know, you it's, it's hard to impossible to make strategic decisions because you just don't have the information. You just don't have the information. Mm. Um, and at the time, like the best guess was to go for it and get around. And of course, situation changed. The forecast obviously changed dramatically, and a system rolled down the coast of Chile just as I'm crossing the continental shelf towards Cape Horn and mm. uh, Diego Ramirez Islands, which was going to be my landfall. I needed to find the islands to, to know where I was, find the lighthouse and the Ramirez. Diego Ramirez Islands and the, on the small group there, and then I would have my navigation set for Cape Horn. So that's where I was aiming. And this thing met me just as I was crossing the continental shelf, and I'd had a, I had a pretty rough night of it. Mm. Um, that's when my wind vane steering system kind of blew, literally blew apart ah. in, in the conditions. Um, Great timing. So... Yeah, great. I mean, great timing. I mean, just where you don't need to be. Uh, and now I wasn't on the lee shore. I was well south. Well, I say well south. I was south of, of what was, but the and uh, Diego Ramirez. I think I'd did. I make my. I made my landfall. I'd seen the light. I think as as this as this uh, gale, and you know the gale turned into basically you know it was near gale turned into a gale turned into a storm. And afterwards, afterwards, we were given. Passage Guardian and told me that the Chileans were forecasting ninety knot ninety knot gusts that night for the for that area. Ninety nine now, zero. What, what nine oh. zero? Now what I got, I don't I don't think was any, I don't think was that anything near that, but that just tells you it was obviously quite a quite a system. Yeah. And it literally blew the top off my self searing system, which I physically physically sort of retained and caught and and took apart and took below. Uh, so my, my so my self steering is out. I'm I'm on the continental shelf. I'm heading for Diego Ramirez Group, which is my landfall, and I've got to get around Cape Horn. And now I've got no self steering. Man, so what kind of uh, sorry? What, what kind night, of self steering did you have? What wind vane was it? Uh, well, it, it was Hydrovane. It was a Hydrovane. Right on. Okay. Which had 
Yeah, so that's the one with the rudder in the water, mm. right? The rudder in the water. Yeah. And they've been, you know, the Hydrovane have been very good and they've, in fact, out of interest, they've adapted the design quite a bit since that, since this Golden Globe race. So they took a lot of feedback, they strengthened it in certain areas, they've, they've made quite a few changes to the product, but it was, it had been a great, it's been a great system. Mm. Um uh, but literally the tops, without going into detail, the top section of it was essentially being blown off. Jeez. Right. It was falling apart on me while just just at that moment, of course, it, of course it's two o'clock in the morning because it's always two o'clock in the <laughs> morning, pitch black. And it was pretty miserable, August, I have to say. And, and in a long story short, I, I kind of rescued the self-steering, but now I've got no self-steering. And I, uh, I actually put call into race control because I said, you know, this is not a good place, not in a good place. Yeah, know where you are. So I'm going to put my drogue out for the night. And I put a drogue out that night to let this thing blow over me uh, because I actually thought I could put the self-steering back together the next morning. In fact, I was pretty confident I was going to be able to fix it. But either way, I was going to put the drogue out. Next morning, I'd hand, hand steer, get myself around Cape Horn, just go around Cape Horn, <laughs> get into the lee of Cape Horn and get out of what, of what there was another system due. Uh, right behind the oh, one that was yeah. over me there. So I, so I had, whatever, 24 hours to get myself around Cape Horn. I'm probably 60 miles away from Cape Horn at this point. So I put the drogue out. Uh, I probably got a couple, and that's an experience. So you put the drogue out and they, people say, and the storm stops. <laughs> no, it doesn't, doesn't bloody stop. <laughs> It doesn't stop. It's just like putting your boat on the end of a, on the end of a, a, a you know, like a bungee jump, actually. <laughs> it just, because it's, of course, the boat's moving on this road yeah. in these seas, and the seas are built to, I don't know what, what, what we, maybe, maybe we had six metres, something like that. Maybe it was more. Oh, yeah. And it was a pretty big sea state. Of course, we're right over the continental shelf there, so it was, it was pretty horrid place to be, hanging yeah. on the end of the drogue. For, and I, I tried to get some sleep for two or three hours uh, and then got up in first light to think about recovering the drogue and getting going. I was about one mile, two miles, maybe two miles off the North Island of the Diego Ramirez group. Mm. And I was getting messages from race control saying, you're two miles off the island. I'm like, well, yeah, I can see it. It's a great big rock out of the window. <laughs> you know, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing my best here, guys. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately what had happened in the night is that although that drogue had kept me nice and stay safe, it had wrapped itself around the hydrovane rudder mm. and it had torn my, torn my hydrovane rudder off. So it completely destroyed my self steering. Oh man. So although I'd taken the top of the self steering off that night and stowed it down below, I go out, I look over the stern and I, and my heart just sank because it was just a stub Mm. Of and a hydrovane rudder is about I don't know three four foot four uh, but a meter long a meter oh, and a half. Oh yeah, probably. And it was yeah. a yeah Big. something like that. And there's like 30, 30 centimeters of this thing left uh. in the water, and the rest is gone. And in doing that, I had a, I had a spare rudder on the board, so that was solvable. I mean, not so solvable in five meter seas, but <laughs> solvable at some point. Uh. Um, but unfortunately it bent the drive mechanism inside the self steering system. Hmm. And that, that, so this is, this is, and at that point I thought, well, that's my race over. This is me and just, just got, I'm, I'm basically my self steering's destroyed. Hmm. Um, and I, and I reported that as well to race control and they said, well, Ian, you've got to get out of there cause there's another system come in. You've got to get around Cape Horn, get going. So I think I spent the next 36 hours hand steering <laughs> in bloody horrible conditions to round the horn, I rounded Cape Horn, got into the lee of the horn on the basis that I was going to go into Ushuaia for repairs and move into Chichester class. Right. Um, so that's what I thought was going to happen at that time. So I, I wasn't out of the race, but I was, I was, I was going to have to go in for repairs. Um, mm. The had an amazing rounding of Cape Horn, had a, just incredible. Probably because I was bloody hallucinating <laughs> and out of my mind by the time by that point. But I had an amazing rounding at Cape Horn. It was incredible. I saw both of the lights in the night. You know, both of the lighthouses. I knew where I was. I knew where I needed where I was trying to go. Uh, and I'm I'm hand steering August, and it, you know you just can't do that for 36 hours. You've got to go below. You've got to try and eat. You've got to do everything else. And it was just miserable. Oh, that sounds miserable so... and incredibly cold. Yeah, that sounds rough. Jeez. Anyway, 
got got around Cape Horn, and then I was in con- I was in contact with Jade, my team manager, because at that point I was moving into Chichester Glass. So you're allowed to use your phone, ah. get yourself to port, repair the boat, like Simon did, uh, and um, other people that moved into Chichester Glass, same as Guy did. Mm. So. That's great, but you you know you're still you're still in Cape Horn basically. The system's coming through. It's March, not <laughs> out know? of the woods. And not out of the woods yet. Find, no, not out of the woods there. And anyway, long story short, the universe had stepped in again. The sailing community were talking in the background. Of course, I knew none of this. And Jade had spoken to a guy. Had spoken to a girl. Had spoken to a guy down in Ushuaia and been connected with uh, uh, the the sailing vessel Jonathan which is skippered by a guy called Mark and his wife, Carolyn, who do Antarctic charters in that part of the water. Mm. And they were off season at anchor behind uh, one of the islands on the, on the Beagle Channel. And between the community of sailors out there, they'd worked out what if Ian can get to the island to Anchorage, then at least he can stop and rest. And then we can make a plan and we'll get him to Ushuaia and we'll get parts and... You know, people will walk in a dock in Ushuaia going, oh, there's a hydrovane. We could strip the parts off that boat with this hydrovane. <laughs> so there was all this going on. But the, the key was, so I got a message basically saying, just get yourself to an anchorage, um, which seemed like a pretty tall order at the time, Mike. I don't mind telling you. Um, yeah. But that's in, that, in, in the end, that's what happened. I got behind Cape Horn. I got into the lee of the islands there. I actually hove to for like six hours and had some sleep, which is a bit sketchy, to be frank, and woke up far too close to the islands for, for comfort. Oh, yeah. Um, and then spent the next day trying to get to uh, Is- Isla Picton mm. and an anchorage, which is one of the first uh, of the larger islands as you come into the Beagle Channel on the south side. So it's in the Chilean section, it's in the Chilean waters. Right. Did, did you when you, um, when you were coming into these places just because you, you have no GPS, obviously, you know, so it's all a celestial out in, out in the ocean. But when you get to this kind of coastal piloting, did you have the charts for this? Like, how did you manage that? It sounds very scary. It is sketchy. So <clears throat> in this case, uh, essentially, I went around the Cape Cape Horn, found my two lighthouses, uh, still you know, using my dead, what was Astro to get me there and then de- dead reckoning. But because I was in Chichester, I was then able to break out my sat phone and the handheld GPS. Oh. So I had a GPS position at that point. You still had to run down, look at it and, and sort of plot it onto, on, onto the chart. I had, uh, yeah, sort of medium scale charts for the area right. there because going in was always an option. And I, uh, it's funny, I've got it on my table here. I carry in the Imray pilot book for Cape Horn, mm. so which turned out to be invaluable because literally I could find, I literally found the anchorage in the pilot book. I thought, okay, I know what I'm looking at oh, here. Great. So still paper. Um, so yeah, it's pretty sketchy. However, because I was in Chichester, I did have a GPS at that point. So at least I, you know, I, I was able to pinpoint myself. Um, but the weather's down there is crazy. I mean, you know, you're either, it's like white out one minute, Next minute, it's blue skies. A minute after that, you've got 35 knots blowing off the islands. It's just Man. crazy, mad conditions in that part of the world, just stunning part of the world. Um, so I found my way to the anchorage, or I found my way near the anchorage because I called Mark on the, I got Mark on, on, I think it was on VHF by then, found him. And I'd gone between, the, between two of the islands. It was complete whiteout. I couldn't see anything. I've only got a readout on a GPS and a chart. I'm hand steering as well. <laughs> and I've been, on the, I've been on the go. How long have I been on the go? I've been on the go 48 hours now. <laughs> and I had the engine on. And, of course, the engine fails. No way. So now I've got no, en- I've got no engine. <laughs> I've got complete whiteout. Complete whiteout. There's no, no chart plotter to allow me to sort of watch where I'm going. And, and so I've got to sail into this anchorage now. Um, <laughs> That's rough. That's, <laughs> and, yeah. Man. <laughs> It wasn't cool. Good times. Mark, uh, Mark said, Mark basically said, stay where you are. I'm going to come and find you. And he brought Jonathan out. And then actually the, 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 the fog had cleared and I was sailing again. And I basically sailed up and met him. And then eventually we, put, we, 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 we pull a line on and he actually towed me into the anchorage, which was quite a way to finish. Mm. And I ended up in 
the anchorage in Isla Picton and spent three days there repairing the boat. And the great thing was I didn't go to Ushuaia. I didn't land. I didn't get parts flown in. I repaired, we repaired my mainsail, repaired the hydrovane. I, re- I kind of almost did a mini refit over like three days at anchor. Wow. You know, just behind Cape Horn on the Beagle Channel. <laughs> And then, and then it started to snow, so I figured it was time to leave. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, it started snowing, jeez. But so, so you were able to fix it just with, with parts that you had on, on the boat, so you didn't need to get anything? So I, um, so I was officially in Chichester class by then. So Mark and Carolyn were able, they were at anchor, they were hanging out there. And with Mark's help, I'm not sure I would have you know, pulled it off without it, but between us, we repaired uh, the hydrovane. Yeah, just with what we had on the boats. So what I had on the boat and what, what Mark had. In fact, you know, I, I did have an amazing amount of equipment and tools on the boat. So I was in a really good position once I had a plan to how to repair this thing. Mm. So we modified the hydrovane design, <laughs> which now involved like a, a, a basically involved an M8 nut where there was a perfectly engineered uh, ball joint before there was now an M8 nut <laughs> basically <laughs> so we re-engineered the hydrovane I had the spare rudder luckily otherwise mm-hmm. I wouldn't have been able to do anything straightened everything out fixed the header unit uh, also my mainsail had a rip so I repaired the mainsail blah 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 a bunch of things um, and kind of and had a couple of days of rest basically I sort of rest and recovered but for me, August, the, the the whole thing about my journey was that was the emotional thing was not to have gone into port. Because mm-hmm. if I went into port, you know what was going to happen. I was going to book into a hotel. I was going to get Wi-Fi. I was going <laughs> to get a good meal. And, 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 and Ushuaia is not easy to get to, right? That's a fair old way up the channel still. Right. And then and then were parts going to come in in time, etc. So... So in my mind, in, you know, in, for my adventure, this was like the pinnacle. I mean, we've got the, you know, Patagonia's laid out behind you. You know, it's awesome scenery. Yeah. Seals are going around the boat. Chilean Navy come in. Chilean Navy, I, Chilean Navy yeah, scrubbed the bottom of my boat, by the way. No Did way, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go figure. <laughs> so, <laughs> Chilean Navy wow. come in with a rib and say, is there, is there anything we can do for you, you know, sir? Yeah, it's good to see you there. Are you they're always concerned in that part of the world. They monitor the area very carefully and they're very concerned about vessels getting into mm. trouble. They really are not particularly happy when they find you're solo. Uh, and then they get very anxious when they find you're solo and you've got no self-steering. So, so you'll be careful what you tell them, mm. but they're, ve- they're wonderful. The Chilean Navy, uh, and it is the Navy rather than the Coast Guard, I believe, they, they manage the area incredibly well. They're so courteous and they are there, you know, in a heartbeat for you. That's so great. their supply ship comes up into the harbour. Uh, we had to move the boat. That's another story. But they came along with the rib to ask if there's anything they could do. And, of course, I'm in Chichester class now. I said, well, yeah, do you have divers? And they go, yeah, yeah, we got, yeah, yeah, blah, 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 divers. I said, well, <laughs> I've got barnacles. <laughs> and, and it took a while to describe barnacles. And the action of scraping right. them off, but they turned up. They turned back up a couple of hours later with two guys in their full scuba gear with a pair of paint <laughs> scrapers in their hands, <laughs> and went at the boat. So uh, uh, that was that was wow. kind of nice. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Like just how again and again here in your story, just like how mariners are taking care of each other. It's uh, it is just uh, beautiful. That's uh, yeah. That's yeah. really nice. Universe, again, stepping in. If Mark and Carolyn were not at anchor in that bay at that time, then I wouldn't have had the local knowledge potentially to pull that off. You know, mm. I would have potentially got to anchor and managed to rest, and I would have been going at Ushuaia. And the fact there was people in Ushuaia walking up and down the pontoon looking to strip parts of other people's <laughs> hydrophanes <laughs> to keep me going just tells you everything you need to know. Uh, yeah, so so that was my little Cape Horn story. And honestly, August, I didn't think it was going to get any better than that. When, when I left, I left in the snow. It was snowing. Mm. And I kind of waved goodbye and went down the Beagle Channel. I thought, wow, that was... I, I, I was in this Chichester class. I'd stopped. Mm. But I would not have had it any other way. That I, I, I can honestly say that now. I would not. And maybe it made me that's the truth about the whole story. It's my story. It's, it's what happened. That was my race. Yeah, and I don't think I would have had it another way. I wouldn't have missed that uh, that experience for the world. It was incredible. Right. Um, 
the next experience less incredible yeah well <laughs> still incredible, still incredible but... <laughs> yeah no, uh... but that's yeah I, I, I was, you know I, I love that way of looking at it I, I remember from uh, from our last recording you know you you said that you were very much focused on your race or, or this was the race against yourself you know that you were to, to yeah. care so much about if you whether you won or what kind of uh, place you got as long as it was uh it was for you which which i think is uh it's a very good way of of approaching yeah. this so um very true in this case very true in this case it was that was it was about my circumnavigation the race was just a backdrop right uh and and for me uh a company almost because i'm it turns out i'm you know i I think I am a solo sailor now. I think I've ticked the box. I can do that. I think, I think but so. I'm also yes. quite a social beast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so having, you know, it wouldn't have been the same to do it by myself, actually, uh, just to disappear over the horizon. So actually to do it in the format of the Golden Globe race added a lot for me. Mm. Um, but in that case, and, you know, we'll talk about future plans again. In that case, it was about my my race. It wasn't about, you know, my position in the fleet or yeah. anything. Yeah. Wow, that was impressive that you managed to um, to, to keep going after, after that. <coughs> Excuse and me. And then, uh, yeah, I guess things um, things kind of you know what uh, you you maybe you thought oh it's just round the horn and uh, you know it's kind of did you think that you were out of the yeah. woods at that at that point? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I get older but not wiser, right? <laughs> but yes, stupidly, I thought that was it. It's all downhill from here. Piece mm. of cake, right? All I've got is the South Atlantic to do. I mean, what's 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 not to like about the South Atlantic in the middle of March? Right? <laughs> so that's going to be a piece of cake. Yeah. And then you know, and then home at home again. But no, genuinely, I thought that was it. I thought that I peaked at that mm. point uh, because because getting getting around Cape Horn, getting to that island. I know I joke about it, but I, that was pretty touch and go. It was it was not not pleasant, and I was really ready for the homeward journey. My you know, I'd repaired my mainsail, my steering was working. Every, I, I had no issues with the boat, really. Food and water wise, I was gone. So mm. I, yeah, I thought I thought I was homeward bound. Actually, I thought it was downhill from there. Yeah, mm. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was. Um, I remember looking at that picture of you in the snow, waving goodbye there from uh, from the Cape, and, uh, and kind of thinking the thinking the same thing, but. Yeah, you had a incredibly yeah. bad luck with that system that just formed right on top of you after that. It was uh, It turns out, yeah. It turns out it turns out that was just seemed to have my name mm. on it. Uh and there'd been a few through uh and um Jeremy ahead of me had got hit by one that was pretty pretty nasty and he'd got through that okay. So we knew, you know, there was still more to come. Mm. Um, and I and I had had a great run out of the Beagle Channel up to the east of the Falklands. Excuse me. Uh, picked up the Falklands current there. Had a really nice run, and then got about I uh, must be five days of headwinds, just headwinds, headwinds, headwinds. Oh. Um, and I allowed myself to go east on this, right or wrong, but at the time it made sense to me. I, I put I allowed myself to put some east in, and then we got the warning. For, actually, got a warning <clears throat> from GGR, which was relatively rare to get gale warnings. Just, one of the ongoing complaints is that the, their warning mechanism, the bar is set a little bit too high for what you're really receiving down there in the south. Right. Yeah, because um, you're not allowed to receive weather forecasts, but they have a limit. Like if it's going to get really tough, then they will let you know as a safety thing. They do. So the idea is if, you have, if there's going to be sustained winds of above 35 knots, then they'll give you just a warning. But invariably, that's like 12 hours away. So, of course, you needed to know that three on your grip files three days earlier because you wouldn't have been there. Yeah. So, invariably, there's very little you can do about it, but maybe you can prepare yourself somewhat. Yeah. So, they have that cut off. Uh, I, got, I got the first warning from Don, uh, and then there was a subsequent warning, and they actually rooted me, which had never happened in a race before. So, I knew it was serious because they actually said essentially go south as fast as you can this thing's got your name written all over it it's very gnarly mm. it's going to be super fast moving but also with that fast moving the you know one of the side effects as you know is that shift from the northwest to the southwest can happen real quick and the sea state's going to be um <clears throat> not nice yeah. 
So they actually, like, uh, right now as we speak, uh, I'd have to go back to the exact order of events, but essentially I had a, I had a warning. Fine, I've got a warning. I'm, I'm, I'm heading north. I'm trying to get out of here. Just another gale. I had plenty of gales by then. Mm. And then they came back and it was, okay, it's going to be much more gnarlier than the gale. It's going to be something else. And then they came back and rooted me south. Mm. And, I, and, root, and to any of us in the GGR, once you're getting rooted, you know you've got a problem. Right. Because that's totally, you're, you're in code orange sort of mode or whatever they, they called it at that point. So, and the unfortunate story is that they rooted me south. I went south as fast as I could. The barometer just went through the floor, just bent the needle. Mm. I didn't know any better. Of, you know, I could have been going through the floor if I was going north, right? Again, I didn't have the big picture. You've got no synoptic chart to look at. You don't have a big picture. And it turned out that the system change, chose to change direction and the routing south put me in the wrong place. Put me, it made, it made this, oh. arguably made the situation significantly worse. Wow. So, so when, when, when this thing hit me, it hit me very, very hard. Yeah. And it was, you know, pretty, uh, pretty bad. Yeah. You know? Pretty biblical. Like, <laughs> Old Testament biblical. Yeah. And, 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 you know, <laughs> again, you were, uh, you were accustomed to, uh, big weather at, at this point. So, you know, you saying that, that certainly yeah. means bad. I've never seen anything like it before or since. I, I've never seen the sea like that. It was, you know, just uh, um, smoke, you know, there wasn't, it was just in, incredible. Yeah. You can't stand in those winds, you know, you have to crawl on all fours. You, it's just, yeah, I, I don't know what was going on because, you know, I didn't have any wind instruments. Uh, I only know what they've told me afterwards. Yeah. Um, but it came through, so it got, it, 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 you know, it, progress, it, it got progressively bad. The sea state was, was pretty horrendous already. It was still coming out of the northwest, but when it switched to the west and the southwest, it was it was literally like a light switch went off, and then it went from pretty, you know, it went from very bad to, you know, what turned out to be non non manageable. Yeah, because yeah, uh, then you got the the, the second just, wave train hitting the first, and then cross seas and correct, yeah. yeah. So, so I think that, you know the seas are probably in the order of eight meters. Some people in the forecasters said it could have been higher, but they were probably about eight meters seas. Ugh. Um, you know, it was 40, but then it was 50 and it was 60. And they say that the gusts were again, we just went off the scale, right? The, 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 you know, what, what, what the forecasters tell us was going on afterwards, yeah. but either way, the boat was just laid on a side by these, by these, by these seas and, and by the winds. Um, it was a real struggle to keep the boat downwind. I was, uh, with using the hydrovane mm. and, and hand steering. So it's called helping the hydrovane. Right. So I'm steering as well. Uh, but of course, you can't do that forever. And I've been on the go now for again, you know, we're into 30, 36 hours or something Ugh. like this. Um, and, you know, the boat was, it was just a real struggle. And we kept, um, she would round up. And it was, the, the, the hydrovane was really struggling to help me keep that and keep, keep it downwind. By now, uh, I'd been knocked down two, a couple of times, two, two or three knockdowns. Wow. Uh, my watertight cockpit lockers were something was failing. I was getting a lot of water in because because the boat's on her side yeah. in the water. So my so the lockers are flooding. Where I keep the drogue is 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 flooding. I can't open that locker because I can't actually get into it anymore. Yeah. You know things were getting pretty hairy. The hydrovane is holding together, yeah. so which was good. So that was that was good. But it was struggling to keep us down. Wow. Did did you have your drogue deployed at this at this point? No, and in, in there is another story, and you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of armchair discussion <laughs> after the event. I, I, I don't have a strong opinion. I was only there. <laughs> try, try, try not to get sucked into the conversation. Um, but the last time I deployed my drogue, it destroyed my steering. Mm. Yeah. Right. So, and not to have my steering down there was like a, kind of a non-option. And then I got to the point where actually deploying the drogue was going to be, was well, not just, it's difficult at any time, but it was essentially in, impossible. I couldn't even access the lockers because the boat was over uh, being laid flat so often mm. that to open lockers and, you know, there's the, the so much water coming in the boat that um, I didn't deploy the drogue. So basically I did not put the drogue out. And I think mainly it was a fear for my steering 
right, and actually getting it there. So I was continuing to try and actively sail the boat. I was down to bare poles uh, by that point. So I'd gone down and down and down uh, and eventually even got rid of my little tiny scrap of storm jib. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I went down below at one point because you have to keep going down below. And I'd gone down to try and put a call into race control. So, yeah, yes, this is like horrendous. This is really bad. And, you know, I knew, August, I knew I was in trouble. Mm. So when I was off Cape Horn, yes, it was really hard. And it was, you know, for most of us in most of our sailing life, that's about as bad as, you know, you ever want to be in. But I, I don't know. I felt I was still, I could still control this situation this was different when when that when that weather went into the southwest I, it, it was just different i don't quite know how to describe it to you but i knew i, I was right on the edge here yeah. and i was actually had this no, i was down below i'd put this i think i put a second call in when we got hit by assume we'd gone well we got hit by a breaking wave mm. who knows and it was just like a it was like a trek it was like being hit by a train wow the fo- he's like being T-boned in a car accident, which is probably more familiar to us. So it, that, that power that rushes through the boat, and you know, I guess we we rolled. We kind of well, the boat did a three sixty, uh, and I I came to on top of the nav desk, like upside down on top of the nav desk, and bloody blood everywhere and water pouring in the boat, and oh, yeah, wow. so that was that was it. <laughs> We'd been rolled, yeah. And the rig had the gone. The rig had gone. Yeah, I'd lost right, the Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, stuck my head outside. First thing you do, go out of the hatch. I had like a submarine hatch on yep. puffing, thankfully. Mm, good call. Thankfully, uh, which was closed. Yeah, that, that made an enormous difference to the, to the security of the, of the boat, uh, particularly later as well, because when we were getting pooped all the time, it would have, you know, I, I was, yeah. Anyway, so... Uh, I stuck my head outside in the, you know, out, out of the companion way and it was just chaos on the deck. Everything was gone. It was just stripped clear and just, you know, carnage out there. Mm. So I went back down below and closed the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to have a think about that situation. <laughs> but, um, and at that point, you know, the EPA went off and, you know, the rest becomes, you know, preparation for sort of <clears throat> self, sorry, excuse me. For self rescue and, uh, and 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 waiting to because once you press that epurb, you've asked for mm. rescue. It's no really longer an option if somebody's going to come and try and get you. Um, and in that there was you know the, the story in that was not easy. The, the first the first vessel, I, I used the term refused carefully because obviously I never saw the communication. But the first vessel that they contacted said they, the conditions were far too bad and they would not divert. divert wow, which is. That tells you yeah, quite yeah, a bit so, of the uh, about the weather, yeah, 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 man. So it was pretty, uh, pretty horrendous. But I, I, it was just you just I don't know the mode flipped. I, I put my head outside. The rig had gone August, and that was it. All that three years of work and preparation, I felt like I'd let the world down. I felt really bad. Actually, I felt I, I almost felt more like I'd let everyone else down than anything else. Wow. And then I just looked at it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to explain that. But I, it was like all your hopes and dreams were like gone then. Bang. Okay. And then I closed the hatch and went, okay, so now we're in survival mode. Let's switch. And you just switch. Because, you know, puffing was, a, you know, it needed to be a life raft at that point. And then after life raft, maybe I can jury rig this boat. Maybe I can get this out. So all those plans start to kick into place. But the first thing you got to do is stop the boat rolling again and stop the boat going down, right? So you've got plenty to do. Yeah, jeez, that's um, that's quite quite scary. Were you? Uh, did you have any leaks at that at that point, like into the boat? So yeah, somewhat. So my hatch, my uh, lockers in the cockpit, uh, although were made to be watertight, were something had failed, mm. uh, and water was getting. So my my power systems, which were based kind of in the lockers uh, so, uh, in, 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 in the cockpit were flooding. So my power was going to go. I was going to lose power pretty soon. I knew that was coming. And then during the roll, one of the hatches, which is, which were closed and locked, had popped mm. open. So the, fo- the pressure must be incredible. Wow. And the water that I had down below, I didn't know at the time, was because that hatch had popped and let in x many thousands of liters not thousands but x many liters uh. of water um 
so that I had about, I don't know, 30, 40 centimetres of water in the boat. Mm. So the bilge was full and, and, and all, you know, I had floorboards had burst, lockers had burst. It was just amazing what comes out. I mean, I was secured for a storm and it wasn't my first rodeo. Yeah. So there was nothing out on that boat. Everything was strapped and lashed down. But the power of that rollover is just incredible. Stuff just bursts from behind, you know, floorboards and, and so on. It's just in, incredible. Wow. Um, so I had water down below at a time. I didn't know if that was water ingress. That was my first my first action was to try and work that out and pump the boat yeah. out. So uh, I turned off the bilge pumps. The first thing I did, turned off the bilge pumps because I knew they were chewing up battery power like mm. crazy. Huh. And and of course, if I'm pumping, I don't, how do I know where water's coming in? So I was trying. So I went around the boat looking for water ingress, couldn't find it, and then just basically sat on the floor and started hand pumping this boat while I worked out what my plan was. So whenever I wasn't doing anything, I was pumping the boat out, uh, trying to get water out of the wow. boat. I got that under control. I felt it was under control. I thought okay, I haven't got water ingress. The the rig slamming on the boat. The sea, of course. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the great irony, of course, is um, just because you've just because you've rolled and lost your mast, nobody told the storm, right? It doesn't <laughs> care. Guess what? It's doing its thing. Nothing's changed. Oh. It's in its southwest. Yeah. Nothing's changed outside. You know, it's just that you haven't got a mast anymore, and the bit of mast that you've got is trying to make a hole in your hull. Oh crap! Yeah, it's like, hang on, guys. This is where we press pause. You right? did it. This you is got where, me. This is God where damn I get it. to you can stop now. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Getting yeah. over, you know. I get to re- I reboot and start you want playing. You to tap again. out at that point and, no. and stop the match. I, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, you're, so your mast so, uh, was still yeah. hanging over the side and it was pounding your hull, right? It was. Yeah. So I was going to have to try and get get that away. And and I guess in 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 hindsight, I tried too early because you know I, you know I, it was it was the conditions were still far too bad to be trying to cut rig away i did i went out and started starting to cut cut it away um there was a few things that were causing problems uh i had to cut lines away so those hatches could that hatch that had burst i could i could secure that um and then interestingly maybe interestingly um i then deployed the drogue go figure (laughs) but i was really concerned about being rolled again and again and again yeah, because I was getting hit by these breaking waves, and I thought one of the even though the you know maybe the main the the mass was acting as somewhat of a sea anchor, hmm. um, you know the boat was regularly you know side on to these to these conditions, so I actually took my drogue out and deployed it in that state, and it turned out to be a fantastic move because it turned the boat stern on to, onto the to the primary wave train at least the primary hmm. one. Um, and when it came to a rescue, it made me a stationary object as well. Uh, and I was lying to the sea almost perfectly for the vessel to come down on me. Right. If that, oh, if that yeah, makes yeah, sense absolutely. during the rescue. Mm. So I deployed a drogue. And in my mind, that was going to help stabilize the boat. I was got to get the water out of the boat. Next thing was to get this rig away from the hull, or at least away from the hull. Um, and you know, that was, that was, a, that, that took multiple attempts and the final attempt I was of cutting that away. I was, I got washed off the deck and this is when I gave up cutting the rig away cause I got washed off the, off the deck and I, I was over the side. Yeah. It washed me straight through the, through the, uh, port oh, bed. Geez. um, so were you like hanging yeah, on, on the yeah. outside of the hole? Yeah. Oh my the, God. Outside, outside of the bloody boat. I, I know it's just crazy. It, it's almost comical to talk about it, but I'm lying on all fours. Cutting away a uh, probably the inner forestay at the time with my angle grinder, mm. and it was too soon. August, I should I should have just waited longer. I guess it was too soon, and the boat got pooped again, and the wave just swept me from you know from where I was on the foredeck through the push pit. Wow! Most of the guardrails had gone by then because the rig had taken the guardrails out, oh, but wow. the push pit was there. And it spun me around, so I was facing into the boat. So my legs that went over, so you know probably because I was grabbing on the way yeah. out. Uh, so I'm hanging over the front of the boat now in, in, in these conditions um, with my angle grinder tied to my life <laughs> vest. 
Dewalt angle grinders, by the way, very good quality. <laughs> Survived, came back, was still working. The, the blade had <laughs> broken, but the angle grinder was fine. Yeah, yeah, angle grinder was fine. That is uh, an so, incredible uh, uh, ad for uh, Dewalt angle grinders. That's uh, impressive. Yeah, yeah, I should get sponsorship <laughs> yeah. next time. Anyway, the um, it was at that point. At this, the, I've, I fast forwarded a little bit, but at that point, I knew the fishing vessel was heading my mm. way. I was maybe six <clears> hours away, and I just thought, "This is this is crazy." You know, you're going to get killed whilst rescue is coming. Get below, and by that point, um, it's hard to describe, but I'd cut enough of the rig away so it wasn't slamming on the boat. So I'd solved the immediate mm. problem. So. If nothing was coming for me, another twenty four hours later, maybe I could have maybe I could have got as far as a jury rig, but I was, I don't know, uh, my, I was about seven hundred miles from South Georgia uh. and about twelve hundred miles in the wrong direction from the Falklands. Um, so, so a long you know, way. I, I knew where I was in the world. Yeah, yeah. This wasn't this wasn't a great. It wasn't ever going to be a great option to try and jury rig and sail out of there. It took us 10 days on the fishing boat of 15 knots to get to Cape Town. So Cape Town was a long yeah. way. You know? um, wow. Yeah. yeah there that's, you go. Uh, that's insane. How how did they rescue you on, under those um, conditions? I've been, uh, you know, I've been talking to people who have been picked mm. up by bigger vessels in, in storms. And often that rescue is the most dangerous part of the whole affair where you're trying to get onto a bigger vessel in that kind of in those kind of conditions how how that go yeah it was pretty uh <clears throat> yeah it's it was, it's a bit do or die basically um so the conditions are moderated i was very very lucky august from from when i pressed the epub to when uh, uh the zidar wang the fishing vessel turned up was only 30 hours mm end to end so that's pretty bloody quick you know i was fully expecting a multi-day wait which is why i was turning basically puffing into a life yeah. raft and then i had plans of self-rescue so i was working it's, it's interesting i'd gone into a process i was literally working through a job list on the boat to keep myself going I, you know completely working through a job list kind of prioritizing what i was doing i tried to eat i tried to do a bit of rest i was just working it so um but uh, you know, um, the other vessels got stood down. The fishing boat was going to come, 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 and come and get me. Um, the two, two, several challenges there. Really, the first one is no communication. So, uh, although somebody wrote an article and said I was talking to the talking to the ship, there was zero communication with the Zidar Wang, mm. and that's partly because English is not spoken on board. Oh wow! So okay. Interesting. So yeah. So there was no one in the bridge with that confidence to, to to speak on the radio. I mean, I only had handheld VHF by this time, uh, but there was zero communication during the rescue. Only eyeballs, hmm. you know, eyeball to eyeball communication. And what they did, the uh, skipper did a fantastic job. I had the drogue out, so I was laying with my uh, stern to the main wave train. Hmm. I think uh, they said the, um, the the sea state had got down to about four meters swell. Hmm. It was still a bit of a cross sea, but it was about four metres well, maybe 25 knots. So conditions had, had really reduced, which made it possible at all. And he came and made a lee, uh, the, like the large vessel would do. So he was, uh, I guess, beam on. Mm. And I'm waving my hands here at <laughs> August, but <laughs> imagine that's kind of making a T shape. So I'm stern onto the waves and he's, back, uh, he's beam on. Uh, and they dropped the boat down towards me, you know, in, in, in steps. And essentially, he crashed his 70-meter fishing boat into my 10-meter <laughs> sailing boat. And that's what it was. It's just a contract crash. To call it a controlled crash would, would have been, you know, um, too, too, uh, too optimistic. Mm. And here's the thing. You don't know this is going to come off, right? There was no, and there was no communication. I didn't know if he was going to get close and then pull away. Oh, you had no idea what he was, he was doing. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no idea. Uh, because, I mean, oh. I know, you know, there's a, there's a good there's a good seaman in there. And if he thinks he's going to sink me and destroy me, then he's, he's going to pull out of there and, and the rescue's off. So there's absolutely no guarantee that this rescue was going to go on. And the second thing, there's no guarantee he wasn't going to sink me in the process because he literally crashed into the back yeah. of the boat. So where the hydro vein is at the back of the boat, that's where it made the first contact. Wow. How, how, how big um, was this boat, by the way? She's about 70 metres, 72 okay. metres, something yeah. like that. So pretty big fishing boat, but luckily, 
the free board is not incredibly high. I, I'm not sure what it was, but it was not crazy mm. high. So as this boat's coming down uh, on me, sort of beam on, beam on, I could see what he was going to do. He was going to come right up to my stern and then hopefully there was going to be a ladder. <laughs> you know, I'd heard about, I heard this story about a ladder. Of course, there was no ladder. There was no ladder in sight anywhere on this boat. And they're, it's a fishing boat. It's a squid fishing boat. Mm. They're at sea for six months of the year. They don't do rescues. This is not part of the plan, uh-huh. right? This is not what they do every day of the week. Uh, there's 45 guys lining the rail in their full safety gear. And I'm looking up at them, these guys, all these faces, and they looked really worried. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> you got a few guys are worried. And I'm down here in my, in my crippled boat, and you're basically going to crash your boat into me. So, you know, as a sailor, you know, bumping into the dock, you know, what, you know, you know how that feels. And this guy's literally going to intentionally crash his boat because he's got no other way yeah. to do it. So, um, yeah, so we're in no communication. No one's on the VHF. I'm on the deck at this point with my, my dry suit and my, my, grab, my mini grab, my comms bag actually strapped to mm. me. I'm looking at these faces. There's no ladder. You know, where are they going to take me? Is it, you know, is it back, you know, is it, you know, is it midships? What's going on? There's no scramble net, no communication, just, just this boat coming at me. And it's, it's kind of seconds away. Right? Yeah. And I thought, well, I've got one chance here really one chance he's either going to pull away and not do this mm. and you know i'm on my own or he's going to hit me and i, I had visions of actually back to my friends the, the self-steering system punching its way through mm. the hole when this thing made contact i had really distinct visions i said this is going to tear my, my not yeah my stern so punching its way through the stern um my life raft was still there so i was re- i was actually i'd prepared taking my lashings off of the life raft and, and so on, because I was ready. I thought, you know, the last thing I'm going to have to do here is potentially get into the yeah. life raft at the, you know, at the end of this. Um, so I look up, the guys are on the rail, nobody's communicating with me, and then I can see one guy shouting orders at the front. I figured he was the mm. bosun. Yeah, it's got to be the bosun. And I could see he was the oldest guy on the deck, and I just eyeballed him, you know, it's just eye to eye, look at me, look at me, and, he's, and he starts nodding, and then he throws a line, you know, with a monkey's fist, right. you know. Boom, throws the line, misses. <laughs> line comes back in, throws it a second time, misses. Look, here we oh go. <laughs> he hasn't done Third time, lands on the fore deck so I could secure a line. So I secured a line to the bow. By this time, she'd, she'd hit me, right? She, we, we'd hit once, twice, three times. It was, oh, jeez. Yeah. It, sort of, it kind of has that motion where the boat's now, where she was stern on, the bow line. There's a bow line on. She swung around, so we're now uh, beam to beam. Side All to right. side, and your your sailing boat wants to seem wants to go underneath. Oh, yeah, the bigger boat. It's kind of yeah. It's a really horrible motion. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. she's she's upwind of you, and she's kind of getting pushed onto and on top of uh, Puffin. On right, top right, of right. you, basically on top of Puffin. So she's slamming against Puffin, oh, slamming. Ha, ha. And and I knew I needed a stern yeah. line on. Yeah, it's like I'm how the, the, I'm imagining now. It's just like this wall of metal coming on on top of you. Like, what, yeah. how, how high was the? If you were just going to guess the height of the freeboard, what do you think? Like, is it ten, 10 meters? meters? Okay, like all right. Like so, yeah, that. so that is something that is like a that. real I've... wall of metal. Yeah. It's yeah, because because you got the freeboard and then they've got this big rail, and because it's a fishing vessel, they have all this equipment there, and you kind of go over mm. all of that to get onto the yeah. deck. Uh, and the guys were kind of on the outside, on the outside rail, which, which is obviously something they tr- they practice because they're all clipped on, and there were just all these faces looking down. Um, so we get <laughs> so still no ladder, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I still don't know how how I'm getting off this boat. <laughs> And I'm thinking, okay, so I've got a bow line on. That's right. And then, then the ladder appears, like a pilot mm. ladder. I thought, thank God for that. Okay, so there's a ladder, but we've only got one line on. And for some reason on the deck, there, was, there, there wasn't a communication to get a second line to me. So I'm now running back to the cockpit. The boat's slamming together, slam once, slam twice. A ladder comes down. I think, great, there's no way I can get to the ladder. So I'm waving a line at the guys. A line, I need another line. You've got to give me another yeah. line. And then somebody clicks, goes, oh, yeah, and throws another line, which I secured to the stern. That brings us in, to, that brings the boats in together. Yeah. And then really, it, it, you know, she slammed again. The ladder was kind of a midships at this point, this, this rope ladder. 
And I just timed it. I just waited for the roll and then jumped. And you, I literally had to jump to, to, to catch the ladder and then went up it like a great rat, <laughs> basically, because, the, yeah. you know, because the boat was going to come, come together again. Oh, yeah. And, and then these hands, these hands just reached down and they just like pulled me by the hair up and then puffing slammed against right, right sort of below me. Oh, wow. Uh, the stub of the mass was like just slamming against the hull. And I was on deck. Next thing I knew, I was on deck. Oh so, wow! Yeah, that's how <laughs> how how did you feel at that at that moment? That must have been. I think I was pretty relieved. I think I was pretty pretty high to be on that deck and surrounded by these yeah. guys, you know. And they're all just uh, oh, the other thing they kept shouting at me was "slow down" or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> slow down, slow down. And I thought <laughs> I didn't know what I was supposed to do. <laughs> Perhaps I looked like I was going too fast, but it was, it uh-huh. was, yeah, of course, I guess it's just this enormous relief. Yeah. Um, and then followed by, you know, it's like awful sadness because the bosun looked at me and Puffy was slamming against the hull and he just looked at me and I knew what he meant. I just nodded at him and then he, he took a knife and he cut the lines, cut, cut both lines and she was gone. That was it. We pulled yeah. away. And that was that was whatever three four years of work that uh, and everything everything yeah. went went with her. Yeah, that must have been uh, you know with all the um, all the time you'd spent with that boat and uh, and preparing her and everything. Yeah, that must have been uh, must have been quite quite tough. Yeah, yeah. Took a while to get used to that idea. It was uh, yeah. I felt it was a loss. You know, it's like it's uh, it's like a bereavement. I know it's only a boat. But we all know it's not only a boat, don't we? You know, it's not a boat. It's, it's vested in so many, you know, so many emotions and so many dreams and every, so many people have put their hearts and soul into getting me around the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. And there I was, you yeah. know, nodding at the bosun so he could cut the lines to let her go. So it was pretty horrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I'm, 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 I'm convinced, you know, that boats have souls and, and, and personalities. So uh, I can uh, relate. Absolutely. Uh but wow, yeah. But w- yeah. like, were you through all of this? Uh, like, were you were you scared? Like, were you, uh, or was it just like pure business mode? Just kind of mm. get get this done. Yeah, I think the uh, probably the only scared. I guess you got you got to be. I find it really hard to tell you that I was scared. No, I'd say not. They probably the if I try to analyze it during. Before we rolled, before that, that that point of that storm, then I knew this was, you know, really, really, really mm. bad. And that was probably the closest to scared I was. After that, no, I wasn't scared. And I was always completely determined in my mind I was I was coming through yeah. this. It was, I never doubted that. For us. It was just how and how long and what I was going to have to do to right. do it. And that's not bravado afterwards. Maybe that's a protection mechanism. So you don't get scared because, I mean, you can't freeze, right? Who else is there? That's right. To do it, yeah. you've got it. You've, you know, um, so, so arguably not. Yeah, is it scary jumping off, jumping for that rope ladder? Yeah, I guess so, but it's not really. It's just adrenaline, isn't it? That's flowing through you at a time, keeping. Yeah, you, going. you don't really have time to think uh, about <laughs> that sort of stuff. Wow. Yeah. The night before, waiting for the rescue on on Puffin, when you know I'd been cutting the rig away and stuff. That was pretty dark, right? Sort of a long, dark night of the soul. Mm. But it wasn't. I wasn't scared. I was just massively disappointed, and and cold, cold, super cold. I mean, my dry suit probably kept me kept me alive in reality. But I'd got super, super cold by that point because I mean, the water's only what six degrees. Oh man, yeah, like six, seven degrees. It's cold most. as well. I hadn't I thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd been in a lot of water that twenty four hours because I'd been washed out the cockpit more than once and you know the cockpit's just filled with water uh august i mean there's so you know it's, <laughs> <laughs> when the water starts feeling warm you know that you're cold yeah. right? um so i guess you put all that together so That's... yeah scared maybe but not not really i can't i honestly can't tell you i was yeah. scared very often that's um that's yeah. incredible i mean well done getting getting off there and getting all that done and were you injured at the time you said you had a pretty bad i got knocked about i was you know i was black and blue when they got me onto the fishing boat and stripped me off my i i'd um 
uh, I hurt my back in the rollover. And that was one of the things that bothered me the most because my back was seizing up, but it was muscular, it mm. turned out. So it was part of it being knocked about. And my shoulder was, I had, a, <laughs> I had like a, a golf ball sized lump growing on my shoulder and I was just blue, right? One down, one side of my body was just really bruised. Wow. So I'd been knocked about a bit, but, you know, nothing was broken, thankfully. Wow, yeah, yeah thankfully. Jeez, that's um, that is pretty, uh, pretty impressive stuff. And now you're now you're on this boat with nobody who speaks English, uh, and like <laughs> that have been such an absurd thing. But, uh, do you want a funny story? I've got a funny yes, story. About how, how long do you want to go? We should do this over a whiskey, really. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Taiwanese crew, fantastic. Took me down below. And they said, what do you want? I said, a cup of tea. I was desperate for a cup of tea. And they brought me a cup of tea. So I, I had a cup of tea and everyone smokes on board. Mm. So I've been offered like, I'd already, I was still in my, still in my dry suit, still got my beanie on. <laughs> still, I still got my life jacket on. And they're like, they're forcing cigarettes in my hand. And I'm sitting there and obviously I'm probably shaking with adrenaline as much as anything. And then next thing they decide to uh, strip me off. Uh, and you know we're all we're all semen together. They just like made me naked. <laughs> I stand in a pool of water. They just made me naked. I like, stood there like shaking, like a wet, literally like a squid. That they, I probably looked like a squid that they just landed on the deck. And they said, right, hot shower, hot shower. They said, okay, yeah, fantastic, hot mm. shower. And they stick me in the hot shower. Of course, it's a bloody salt water shower. I thought, okay, at least it could have been fresh water. <laughs> My first hot shower in 219 days, and it was a salt water shower. Um, so they shower me, get me up to temperature, mm. and um, <clears throat> gave me some, you know, dried me off. The bosun, the bosun came along. The bosun was in charge of medical issues on mm. the boat. And, uh, you know, very professional boat, incredibly well, well run. But the bosun was a gnarly old sea dog. He was the guy that had cut the lines on. Um, so he puts the blood pressure monitor on me on one hand. There's another lad that was strapping my shoulder up. And I, I had a, quite a gash in my mm. forehead, which had been a problem on the boat because I was bleeding like a, you know, I was bleeding into my eyes a lot. So I had this gash right. in my forehead that they wanted to sew, sew up. But the, <laughs> the bosun puts the blood pressure on me. Like, like can you imagine what my blood pressure was going to be? <laughs> because he had a form to fill out. So he needed to, to every six hours take my blood pressure. Right. But while he's taking my blood pressure, he's smoking like a Marlboro Red, <laughs> blowing it into my face. <laughs> Everyone's smoking around me. That's, and uh, I'm looking at it, and I just remember the, the irony of this blood pressure test. And, he, and then he goes, ooh, not very good. He's shaking his head at me. <laughs> what did you expect, you know? So, uh, That's, uh, so anyway, they stripped me down. They gave me some clothes to put on mm. August and they gave me a bunk, a bunk. And they, um, some of the guys spoke some English. The crew was mixed crew, Taiwanese boat, Taiwanese skipper, Taiwanese first engineer. <clears throat> and then most of the guys who were the fishermen were either Indonesians or Philippines, mm. uh, Filipinos. And just so happens the Filip some of the Filipinos had a, had, had a bit of English and the guy that had the best English was assigned to look after me. Mm. And they said, you're going to be in here with Davy. This is Davy Jones, right? And I went, <laughs> okay, no, are you, <laughs> do you guys speak more English than I write? Are you taking the mic? You're going to put me in the locker with Davy Jones if you've just rescued <laughs> Yeah, and his name was his name is Dave, Davy Jones uh, Balcom. His, his family name was, but his first name was it Davy was. Jones. And they, uh, I kid you not, his name was you Davy went, Jones, and they put me in the they locker. They put with you Davy in Jones. Davy Jones locker. <laughs> that's uh, that's. Were, were the irony of that kind of? Were they aware of the connection? Went straight over their heads. It took <laughs> it took ten days to try to explain what Davy Jones was all about, and eventually one of the guys had Pirates of the Caribbean. On his on his device, oh, right. Right, downloaded, <laughs> and we finally got to Pirates of the Caribbean and managed to get to the bottom of the Davy Jones story because they had no idea what I was oh, talking that about. It's rich. So, That's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. So they were great. I mean, perfect. I mean, it's it's again, it's just seafarers, right? It's just no questions asked. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Whatever they could do. Yeah. 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 Kindness to strangers, my that's, friend. Uh, that's incredible. 
I mean, that is one hell of a sea story, uh, Ian. I'm, um, I'm, 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 I'm at the edge of my seat here. Uh, it's, 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 uh, that is incredible. I'm, I'm so happy you were, you know, you, you, you're right. And uh, I mean, what an adventure, um, even though you didn't reach Le Sop de Lom with, with Puffin. But man, it's, um, that's just incredible. Um, yeah, I mean to lose to lose to lose your boat is awful. Um, I, again, um, I'm going to say it again, and, and I, I, there's a bit of me that that doesn't like to admit this or, or say it, but that that's what happened. That was the story. So that was maybe the way it was meant to be, and that's the, uh, perhaps it's the only way I deal with it. I would never have had that experience if that hadn't happened. I would never have spent 10 days on a Taiwanese fishing boat with the most amazing crew going to Cape Town. Yeah. I wouldn't, you know, my adopted family in Cape Town, I wouldn't have that now. So I try to, I think that I try to focus on that. I mean, that's, that was an amazing experience. Yeah. Terrifying in the moment, but you know, I'm more for it, yeah, I guess. That's, uh, that is fantastic. Um, wow. Well, thank you, um, Ian. You know, we're, we've been we've been going here now for almost uh, almost two <laughs> hours, and, and uh, it's uh, you know it, it almost feels um, uh, you know of course this is like what half of uh, your big adventures that you've been through now since we last spoke. Um, I think. Do you, or should we should have a part should we two? Do a part two? Do you, do you want to do that for the OGR? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's um, sure. yeah. Why? Why not? Yeah, why not? I'm sorry. I would, it's, uh, uh, oh no, no, no! Uh, this is this is fantastic. I wouldn't have had it any other way. I mean, that was such a such a great story, and um, it's it, uh, you know, when uh, I've been to film festivals quite a bit, where you just like you watch film after film after film, you just try to cram in as many films as you possibly can, but then sometimes you get hit buy a film that is so good that you just sit in there and you see it and like you know what i'm just gonna sit the next one out i, I need a i, I need a uh, <laughs> just uh, can, uh, i need some time Emotional to rest, rest after this one i need to <laughs> yeah. um, uh, digest this one a little bit and, and that's a bit how i feel after uh, after your ggr uh, story so i think uh, uh, yeah i think we could all Use uh, use some time and uh, and digest this, and then we'll yeah. we'll do your uh, no doubt amazing ODR <laughs> story for a part two. I would love that. That'd be that'd be great. Um, well, it's quite a contrast, anyway. It's quite a contrast from whatever two hundred nineteen days alone at sea, ten days on a Taiwanese fishing trip, <laughs> <retreat>, and then <laughs> and then back to Cape yeah. Town. I mean, net net, I you know, if, if we're finishing there, I I think I gained more than I lost. Mm. I mean, just talking to you today, August, I mean, you know, I gained more than I yeah. lost. And it's, you know, I also gained a lot of knowledge. And I know, you know, a, a better skipper on another day would have got, may have got away with that. I didn't. That was who I was at that day. Maybe next time I'd, you know, I'd put it off. But uh, finally, you take it all in, all, all into, into, into the calculation. I think I've gained much more than I lost. And, uh, you know, I'm better, better for yeah. it. And and I mean, you're you're still here, right? You you, you made it. You survived, yeah. which is it sounds like a, that's a huge accomplishment in the, uh, all things considered. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, yeah. I'm glad cool. you're glad all you're good. still here and, uh, and 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 back with us, Ian. So uh, that's great. Wow. Thank well, you. thank you, thank you so much, uh, Ian. Um, um, this is this is great, and I'm 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 looking forward to uh, to doing a part two with you uh, sometime soon. <laughs> Thank you again. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. I always uh, listen to you guys for a long time, so it's great to uh, catch that's, up. Like that's that. great. Yeah, that was uh, really really good to really good to see you again. And you you touch on so many things. I've got I pulled out my letters from my daughter just between us. Mm. Um, I never told you this story, but. Uh, Maybe I should. I should remember. She wrote me two letters for the GGR, mm. and she hid them on the boat. Uh, I didn't know they were on the boat. In fact, I did. I found the letters. I didn't know they were from Emma. Didn't know they were from my daughter. Mm. And I just thought, okay, that's interesting. I'll I'll put them away inside a book, and I'll go back to them. And then at Cape Horn, the letter said on the outside. One said, "When when things get hard, read this." And then this one said, "When things get a little harder." Oh, wow. Uh, two left. 
So <laughs> the first one I opened in Cape Horn, and it was a lovely letter uh, from her because things were feeling pretty hard. And then this one, which survives because came with me off the boat, it said, you know, open, it says, open when things get a little harder. And I've never opened it. You've never opened and it to this day? I never opened it to this day because it was my talisman. Because I get all emotional telling you this. I probably couldn't do it on the podcast, but I had it in, in with me during that night and after the roll. And I, it was just, if I open this, that's the end. If I don't open it, it isn't oh, hard. Right. It's not hard. This is not hard enough to open the letter. And that's what I kept saying to him. This is not hard enough. Doesn't matter. This is not hard enough. You, it's not tough enough. So don't open the letter. And I've still got it. I still never opened it. It came home with me. So. Oh, that's um, incredible. They're on my desk here. And they're just sitting here on my desk. They're the same. So, uh, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> But it's funny how these things become, you know, like talismans for you. Um, yeah. It's just, yeah. Oh wow, that is incredible! <laughs> yeah, and and you got that with you off the boat. That's the, uh, that couldn't have been many things that you. But you did you deliberately I, choose to, I, I, to take that? Yeah, one? yeah. I've I've got a bag. Perhaps I should tell you the story. I've got a dry bag about this big. So I mm. packed. I packed for my holidays to leave the boat. So I had two enormous bags because at one point I thought, well, I'm going to end up in the Falklands here. So I've got a bag of gear, and then I've got all my logs everything I wanted to keep, all my logs, my diaries, and everything were in a bag ready to go. But that rescue, when it happened, was fast and furious. The, the boat appeared from nowhere, yeah. and it happened real quick. And, I, you know, a couple of times I looked like down my companion way, and I looked, and I thought, I can't go and get this. I can't go down below now and start lugging, you know, North Face, 60-liter North Face bags out, and I'm yeah. going to climb on this boat. So I left the bags but I had one dry bag this big, which I put, mm. uh, excuse me, I've got all the bits here because they, they came home with me. And in, in that dry bag, I'd put my puffin, which the, <laughs> my, my nieces and nephews gave me. So the oh, idea yeah. was that this has got uh, sand and pebbles from the beach in North Wales where the boat was came, came mm. from. And I, was meant, I had to bring that home. Uh, the boat originally had a crucifix on it, and I'm not uh, religious. So I kept this. When Istvan sold me the boat, he said, do you, do you want this? I went, well, no, not normally I wouldn't. He said, well, it's always been with the boat since the original owners. What do you think? And I thought, well, no, if it belongs to the boat, it belongs to the boat. In the mm. rollover, it disappeared from where it was on the boat. It used to be put on my chart table, and it wow. was gone. And just before the rescue, it, it was because still had water. It, it popped up. It was floating on the floorboards. And I picked it up. I went, oh, there it is. And I put it in this bag. And suddenly it'd give me wow. a, a charm in, in the sub. So I had a bag that big. And in that, I put my wallet, my, my, my watch for my wife, my wallet, my whatever, my phone, my mobile. Yeah, my, my iPhone yeah. went in the bag, puff in the sand and Emma's letters. And, it, and I clipped them to wow. my life vest. And that's why they came off the boat because they were still clipped to me, yeah. uh, and that's and that's all I came off the boat boat with. What I stood up with my wallet, my phone, and puffing, and yeah. uh, and and Emma's letters. They went in there, and they were like really damp, but they dried, and yeah. um, they came with me. So there you go. Wow. And and this this belongs to the um, to the family. I, I'm going to have to return it. That originally owned Port Puffin back in the eighties. So, oh yeah! You know, oh, what, they would they would be blown away by getting that one back. So they're still in touch, and uh, yeah. yeah, it came off the boat. But uh, and I, you know, wow. this is not. I'm not. I'm not a believer, but it bloody popped up, August. What the hell? <laughs> Out of the wreckage, that was my boat. I went, oh, okay. So I've got to take this with me. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. What's the saying? Like, no, there's no atheists in foxholes. That's but, right. Um, no atheists yeah. in foxholes. And I, I was I was willing to back any side at that, at that point <laughs> to get out of that particular corner I was in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no, nobody bet. out there that doesn't belong it believe in God anymore. Yeah, that's for yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's um that's incredible. But that letter, Ian, that's that is beautiful. I, um yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. What a talisman. It's not hard enough yet. It's not yeah. hard enough yet. That's, yeah. that's, that's keep awesome. keep telling yourself that. Huge thanks to the talented, hardworking, and handsome folks over at the Quarterdeck for sponsoring this season of On The Wind. 
Join the crew at 59-note.com slash quarterdeck. On the Win is the podcast about sailing created by 59 Degrees North and hosted by me, August Sandberg, Andy Schell and Emma Garshagen. The show is mixed and produced in Maryland by Lee Cumberland. Episode artwork and website show notes are done by Laura Parent in San Francisco. The intro theme music was written and performed by former podcast guest Cameron Dale, while the outro music you're hearing now is by our friends, the Storm Weather Shanty Choir, who have also been on the show. We love hearing from you, so please send us a note at holdfast at 59-north.com, And you can also help us out a lot by reviewing the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It really does help. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, hold fast. And when me money was all gone on liquor and the horse, I made up me mind that I was inclined to go to see no more no more no more to go to see no more i made up me mind that i was inclined to go to see no more as i was walking down the street I met sweet Angeline She said, come home with me, me lad And we'll have a cracking time But when I awoke, it was no joke I found I was all alone My silver watch and my money too And my whole bloody gear was gone Was gone, was gone My whole bloody gear was gone It was when I awoke it was no joke For my whole bloody gear was gone As I was walking down the street I met Big Rapper Brown I asked him if he would take me in And he looked at me with a frown He said Last time you was paid off with me You took up no score But I'll take your advance and I'll give you the chance to go and to see once more. Once more, once more, to go to see once more. I'll take your advance and I'll give you the chance to go to see once more. Sometimes we're catching whales, me lads, but mostly we get none. With a twenty foot oar in every pour from five o'clock in the morn. And when daylight's gone and the night's coming on, we rest up on our oars. I know, boys, you wish that you was dead or snug with the girls ashore. Ashore, ashore, or snug with the girls ashore. Oh, boys, you wish that you was dead or snug with the girls ashore. Come all you seafaring lads that listen to me song When you go a big boating boys make sure you do not go wrong 
You take my tip when you come off a trip Don't go with any horse But get married instead and have all night in bed And go to see no more No more, no more To go to see no more Get married instead and have all night in bed And go to see no more No more, no more To go to see no more Get married instead and have all night in bed And go to see no more